when we talk about reform, it is not to reform Islam itself, but to reform the understanding of Islam. And the problems that we face now is we have to reform, we have to start it from ourselves. And in order to make a reform, you have to seek knowledge. And this is the most important tool. And of course, Prof. Tariq Ramadan has enlightened us, perhaps with the time constraint. If we were to have to, if we were to read his book on the radical reform, it gives you a very clear perspective of this subject matter. I'm not going to take or to give another lecture because I want to give you an absolute freedom but with some limitation of time that I'm controlling over you. <laughs> okay, we shall finish by 12.15. That is including the injury time. Right? Because I want to give ample of time for you to have a... Can I have the first three questions? Who first? Uh, thank you so much. Can, you, uh, can I have your names? Yes, uh, Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, my name is Nicole. Uh, I'm a writer. Uh, it's a wonderful speech. Uh, your work has helped me tremendously, you know, growing up. And, um, but I always remind myself, as much as it inspired me, I also read your work with a very critical eye myself. And uh, maybe it's just out of the way, but um, I've been following you uh, with the Charlie Hebdo case recently. Since I'm writing about it, uh, I'm, I, I, I write for newspapers. Uh, so just want to ask you that in a Democracy Now! interview recently with Amy Goodman, you had, so this, this understanding that you say that looking at the world and understanding it, changing the way we look at the world, but an aspect of trying to understand the world at the same time, to understand and not to look away. This aspect of, of that the ISIS people and all these so-called quote-unquote jihadists are just insulting our religion, but not understanding what leads people to resist the way they resist. I'm not being an apologist for them, but I just want to, maybe I, I feel there's this lack of dimension of understanding what leads people to such kind of terror. When a person performs a suicide bomb, for instance, what leads a young man with dreams, with hope, with love, to go to that extent of his life to go and do that? I feel that that understanding is a bit lacking from, uh, because I think being a middle class European scholar yourself, I think it's a bit unfair to speak for poor working class Muslims and trying to group it and to say that it's insulting Islam. Because, but whose Islam is it insulting? Since Islam is so clearly that you, the upper class rich Muslims, and they, the working class terrorized Muslims. Do you think it's fair on that behalf to speak? Maybe if you could talk more on that. And my second very quick one is, you spoke about competition just now. Competition is good for gold. Would you use the word competition for free market policies that is terrorizing the world, which is also translated as good competition, healthy competition. So would you say that capitalism and free market policies is good competition when the world is not equal, there's no equality? Itself. So, how do we talk about competition when we, we're talking about a very unequal world? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can we have the second question from here? Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Izmi. I would like to ask um, Professor Tariq about you, you said about um, you know, our fitra is essential to understand the message, and you know, I always believe in Islam is fikra musfa salah, like we have the common sense to differentiate between the right and wrong. And you talk about knowledge and career to be free, to seek our own knowledge and our dignities to deal with our own freedom and knowledge. Um, what are your views about, like, of course, um, pers my personal chat is not to be a monkey do monkey here Muslims. Like, I want to make up my informed opinions by seeking knowledge and understanding it before practicing some. Um, and of course, in, in, in making my own opinions, in seeking knowledge, what are your views about like read, um, learning about knowledge that might not agree with the mainstream scholars' a view of Islam uh, and the use, using of Sharia um, laws, rules to prevent Muslims from 
um, reading those kind of scholarly articles, like for example books or at, um, scholar views, like from um, Alayaham, uh, Jamal Bana, or books on Ishak Manji, or books like that, in order for us to decide ourselves that it is wrong, instead of just listening from people that it's wrong and just not have any access to it. And oh, which is better in being a good Muslim? Like you know, I mean. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi taala wa barakatuh, and uh, good morning. My name is Muhammad Mahyudi and I'm with uh, IIUM, International Islamic University of Malaysia, and I'm also with CENTRA, which stands for the Center for um, um, Human Rights Research and Advocacy, CENTRA. So the question that I have are twofold. First, um, you started off by uh, focusing on this idea of reforming the self. So my question now, looking at the protagonist that you have mentioned as well in your lecture, and this is referring to the Sufi reformists uh, that uh, you have also mentioned in other talks that you have given. So, what is the touchstone of the contemporary Sufi reformists? Because obviously, you didn't uh, say that there's no role for them, yes, by emphasizing that there is this great reverence on the Persona of uh, Ibn Tamiyah, you are basically giving credence to the Sufi reformist trend of engaging with reform in the contemporary world. So my question is, what is the touchstone? What are the criteria of contemporary Sufi reformist? Okay, that is one. And secondly, this is regarding um, uh, liberal Muslims. This is again the question of protagonist. Um, how do you engage with liberal Muslims when to them uh, the sky is to us rather to the majority sky is the limit but to them even the sky is not the limit because they seem to subscribe to um, Nike's just do it uh, motto because obviously they believe in Adidas declaration of independence impossible is nothing so how, how do you then respond to this group of people who don't even have competence on, say, the question of interpreting, interpreting the Qur'an. They are engaging into this. When we talk about liberal Muslims, they are engaging into efforts of reinterpreting the Qur'an. And uh, so how, how do you engage with them when they don't respect the issue of competence and they don't even respect the question of limits? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you for, for these questions. In fact, I have five questions so far. Um, um, I think that you, you, your point, it's, it's a very important one. And if you listen, I don't know if you, you followed all what I said during this. Uh, it's not this, only this crisis on Charlie Hebdo, but it started even uh, with the uh, Danish cartoons. Uh, my position is exactly this one, just to make it, to summarize it. What they did is not only non-Islamic, it's anti-Islamic. And this is a position of a legal position, a normative position. Now let me start with uh, the way I was uh, uh, tackling the issue. To any of these situations, there is a religious response and a political one. We have to be very clear on the religious one. And we have to tackle it. If somebody is doing something saying, I'm doing it in the name of Islam, the scholars should take a position. Is it right? And then you have to say something on the political side, and you have to explain by saying, look, explaining is not justifying. Explaining is to try to understand. And I've been repeating, you can't only condemn the consequences. You need to deal with the reasons. When I was involved in the task force with Tony Blair, he, he set a task force and I was there for one and a half months. And I said it clearly, I'm okay to be within with one condition, I, I should be able to speak my mind. Which is independence. And I was there, I say, he said on TV, there is no relationship between our foreign policy and the fact that they are killing in London. I responded, in ethical terms, Mr. Blair, you're right. You cannot justify killing innocent people in London because of what you are doing there. In political terms, you are wrong. Because he is saying it himself. You are killing us there, we are going to kill you here. 
He's wrong in his political understanding, but there is a political, there are reasons for that. Frustration, colonization, and you are going to kill people. And for them, there is a, 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 a political understanding. So you have to deal with this. And you have to deal also with the reasons. So I said in France, there are domestic reasons in the way you are treating people in this country. And there are international reasons you are going to kill. You are at war and you don't tell the people that you are at war killing people in, 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 in Iraq. In, in, in. So it doesn't justify what they did. But there are reasons that we have to tackle. You want to solve the solution, to find a solution, you cannot, you cannot avoid talking about the reasons. But to use the reasons to avoid condemning the acts is wrong. So I think we need both. And this is the way I was trying. Uh, and when you say this, people in France are saying, you know what, you are not clear. Double talk. It has nothing to do with double speech and double talk. It has to do with explaining is not justifying, condemning is a prerequisite, and then we talk about the political side. And I don't like the, the, some of the scholars who are just condemning and they abide by, you know, the, the narrative that we have in the West. It's as if, you know, I said it straight away after, I was the week after September the 11th, I was in, in the States. And then George W. Bush is saying, they are doing this to us because they don't like our civilization. I said, no, why right? if they don't like your policy, your politics, the way you deal with the, the world, this is it. It has nothing to do with democracy and freedom. It has to do with the way you deal with them. It has to do with your policies around. And I have to, we have to be clear on that. So I think that this is a very important point. As to the competition in the free market, I had also in one of our seminars, we have a discussion about this. And we are talking about, you know, what is Islamic finance? What is Islamic economy? And one of the scholars was saying, you know, uh, in fact, the Islamic model is... Uh, is uh, regulated capitalism. I say, I'm sorry, I can't I agree with this. Because freedom in, in economy, it's not only the freedom of the free market, it is the goals, what do you want to achieve, and the means. So you get this from what I am saying. You have to challenge the economy by, by putting some Islamic rulings into the, the capitalist system, which was what, by the way, what Sarkozy was saying. Uh, Stiglitz is saying, and uh, Soros uh, is saying, they're all saying we need more regulations within the system, but we keep the same objectives. For us, freedom is a prerequisite, but we need to have goals. It has to do to be ethically oriented, and the free market is not. The free market is, in fact, the jungle where the dominant are setting the scene and they are playing with us. So it's, by the way, it's not a free market. It's a free market for some, as you understand. So this is why we have to challenge the whole thing, the whole system. Um, what you were saying about reading the, the, I think that some thought that we are going to protect our students and our, protect our community by telling them this is what you have to read and you have to avoid that. That's over. You can't today just prevent people from reading. And we have to read. The question is, how do we go for this? And myself, of course, when you are dealing with, you know, uh, some of the names that you, I had to challenge many, many of them. One of them was my great uncle, Jamal al-Banna, rahimahullah. He was used to come to us. He has very special opinions on many things. And I was challenging him and he was challenging me. And I was reading. And by the way, beyond all what is said, I might disagree and I might have disagreed with many of his views, but he was a, a, a man of principles. Very, very intellectually strict. And this is where we have to go. We need to keep our ethical principles. We have to challenge to read. But then we also have to equip ourselves, because if you are not equipped, you know, by the way, why the Prophet ﷺ was saying that you don't have to read, you know, the scriptures of others. It was at a very specific period of time afterward. Of course, we need to have to, to get the knowledge. So you have to equip and we have to use what they are saying to help you to get more knowledge. It's very, you know why I started reading as a crazy young man? Every day I was reading five hours a day and eight hours. You know why? It didn't come from my family, in fact. I, the books were everywhere. But I was much more about football. 
And then one, I was, I was 14. And then I had a teacher. And this teacher, my last book in French, which has a dialogue with a great French philosopher, I dedicated it to him. Because 20, 35 years later, he came to me to the, uh, the book fair in Geneva. And he was behind me and he said, did like this say, Tarek. And I saw him say, wow, 35 years later, this teacher came to listen to me at the book fair and say, you don't know how much you gave me. And you taught me. And he smiled and said, and now you are teaching me. 25, 35 years later, he came to me, this teacher, and he was the one who has challenged me so much about my faith, so much about my, my beliefs that I said, no, I'm going to struggle. I'm going to come back to you. He was teaching me uh, and, and sometimes challenging me in all my you know, faith and religion and thoughts. I was going back home reading books. I have to answer. This is good competition intellectual competition but I had to read and I was reading philosophers you know Western philosophers and he gave me this this you know uh, strength to get more knowledge in order to answer and he helped me to be a better Muslim by reading non-Muslims I became a better Muslim by reading somebody who wrote God is dead and now I know why God is alive you get my point? So with you know, all other Muslims, you have to get this knowledge, but you have to, to be equipped. You have to, 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 to take this and to try to, to add knowledge to knowledge. I, 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 would, I wouldn't go for something which is having law preventing you from reading. I don't know, I don't know anything like, I, I wouldn't, this is not my tradition. I don't want law to prevent people from getting knowledge. I want educational process to equip the people to deal with knowledge, not to prevent them from knowledge. And I would say that this is my position. This is the position where I don't, I, I think that your question is orientated. I, I, <laughs> that's that's your intention. My, <laughs> I don't I don't I don't have a problem. No no, I don't have a problem. I'm just giving you my position. I wouldn't I wouldn't go that way. The legal thing of preventing you from reading and all this, uh, and I think that you have to be equipped. Take them as good challenges for you to get more knowledge and to know how to respond. Uh, now, uh, this, the, the fourth one is about reforming the self and the Sufi thing. What you were saying about that, uh, yes, I'm, you know, I have a book coming which is an introduction to Islamic ethics. And I'm dealing with the, the, the Sufi tradition as much as I've been writing about this and talking about this. And I think that. Uh, I don't want, what we have today in our Muslim communities is trends that are now in fact translating into the ground this categorization of knowledge and hierarchy of knowledge that we had in our sciences. And now you have the Sufi trends, you have the legal trends, you have the Salafi. We are all talking about unity but, and brotherhood, but we are more brothers than others and it's about ourselves. I think that we have to challenge this. And this is where I think that the people who are dealing with the legal should understand that you can't reduce Islam to halal and haram. And the people who are talking about Sufis by telling you, you know what, it's to be to pray during the night, to educate yourself, to be far from the world, say that's not right. How are you going to be a rahmat and alamin if you are only a rahmah for yourself? How are you going to deal with this? And when you come to me and you say, you know what? And this is why I refuse to, to go to some conventions around the world. And say, so you call about, you know, uh, I, I'm not political. I'm far from politics. And I'm, as I'm telling you, no politics is politics. And you are supporting some statements. And some of them are even in the name of, you know, they are flying the whole day, but they, supported, they are supporting dictators. You know, you are not flying. This is not sincerity. 
And this is why I'm, I'm saying to some of them, at least be silent. And some of my scholars, some of the people I respect so much for the knowledge, I don't respect them for their political stance. I wouldn't do that. I say, I respect your knowledge, but what you are saying now in political terms, that has nothing to do with knowledge. It's even the opposite of knowledge. So I would say that, and when we have now new trends of people saying, you know, be a Sufi and, and educate yourself, they are, they are keeping you obsessed with education, 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 and you keep on saying, I am going to be involved, and I am going to be educated. When? Oh, inshallah. It's now. Education should be for, and I'm always taking this example. The Prophet ﷺ was praying during the night to change the world during the day. And when he arrived in Medina, he said to the people, if should salam, during the day, give food to the poor people. To the poor people, be engaged with solidarity. Silul Arham, be careful with your life. Sallu wan nasuniyam. And then you pray during the night. You pray during the night because you are acting, behaving, changing, reforming, struggling during the day. This is Sufism. And this is why I'm always saying if you want to get a very quick, uh, very quick synthesis of the four criteria that are important when you deal with any Sufi circle, four things. The first one is that they are very strict with all the obligations and all the prescriptions. There is no Sufi trend telling you, you pray less, you fast less, you can drink alcohol, because you have vicar. Today was, I drink and I remember. No, you are ignoring, you are forgetting. You have, I'm not joking, you have new type of Sufis that are forgetting the rules, the principles. And in fact, the Sufi is respecting the rules and adding nawafid. This is one. Second is the Sheikh, the Murabbi. Is he helping you to be close to Allah or close to him? Do you worship Allah or do you worship him? Is it serving you or are you serving him? That's it. I always look at the Sheikh to know what is the reality. But people are saying a zuhd and things that have to be far from the world, and you look at Mercedes and money and... Eh. I have a problem with a zuhd in a luxury environment. Since two. Third has to do with the relationship with power. Are they supporting power? Are they instrumentalized by power? Are they accepting this? And this is the point. All the colonial powers sometimes use the Sufi circles to help them to settle their colonization. Independence. So, not serving any power. Fourth, money. How are they dealing with money? You go in some areas, they are asking money from the followers and the murida, and they are very rich, and they are asking for poverty. And they are obsessed with money. It's a very serious issue. Money, you know, لِكُلِّ أُمَّةٍ فِتْنَةُ أُمَّةِ المال. This is what the Prophet ﷺ. For every uh, community, there will be a uh, a test and the test of my community is money tell me how they deal with money so the Sufi circle where the sheikh and the people around him are using money asking for money getting your money and not helping you to 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 deal with this spiritual experience I would say that these are the four and, and that's it so uh, about the 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 liberals you are right. I think that what you said is that they don't respect competence and they don't set limits. Uh, this is why we need two things. Don't try to deal with the liberals only on religious terms. You need to have both. Because they are used for political reasons sometimes and they themselves, they have a religious agenda. Or a cultural one. They want to be acknowledged by the West. Or they have surrender to the dominant uh, uh, narrative or dominant civilization. So this is where it's very important to show and to deal with them by saying that and showing that Islam is a science. We are dealing with knowledge. So we are here dealing with knowledge that you cannot 
Uh, and you take examples. Sometimes they are, you know, we have to democratize the way we read the Quran. And just take an example. It happened with me with two or three of them. By taking one verse, said, can you explain to me what it means? And you can just see. Sometimes they don't know Arabic. Sometimes they don't know. They know nothing. It's just repeating and they are. So democratizing is good, but if you don't know the context within which something was revealed, or a verse was revealed or said, so we need to challenge this. On the other side, we also need to come with a political understanding and to challenge them on this. What are you serving? What are you trying to do? What is your point here? So it's a twofold. It's a two way of dealing, but not only a religious one, because sometimes you come with the religious and they play with the political. And sometimes you only deal with the political and you are not equipped religiously. So we need to have to, to challenge them on both things. And then at the end, it's also a question of sincerity. It's also a question of uh, they are used by some trends, you know, the so-called ex-Muslims. And you go to them and say, why do you want to add ex-Muslim? Tell us about who you are now instead of telling us who you were. What is the point of saying you are an ex-Muslim? So you have a, a problem to solve. So, so this is why we have also to be uh, quite clear on this and, and sometimes just uh, uh, to understand that they are playing a game which is beyond them. They are accepting it or not, or they are not even aware of it. Uh, some, and, and we have also to be very clear on not putting all the people in the same boxes. You know why? Because some, I met some people who are very harsh with Islam. In fact, they are not harsh with Islam, they are harsh with their past. They are harsh with the way they were taught Islam. They are harsh with the way, depending on the way the parents were, the way your husband or your wife was. You can ch this can change your mind. So we have to be very cautious. You know, I'm always saying something. Even with the people with Charlie Hebdo, I put this clearly. We have to be very, and this is the Islamic tradition. The legal tradition is judging a behavior and act, not definitively a person. Never. Be very, very harsh with the statements, very strict with the behavior, but never judge definitely a person. Never. Even the people who are beyond you are hypocrites. You don't know. Hypocrisy is not an eternal qualification. It could be a moment in your life. You know why I can tell you this? Because maybe yesterday or maybe tomorrow or maybe today you are a hypocrite yourself. Isn't it? How can I can say this? Because one of the highest men in the ethical standards like uh, Omar, radiallahu who was called asking, am I not a hypocrite today? Do you feel the perfume of hypocrisy? It means check yourself. And if you know this with yourself, be careful with the people. They can be very tough against you today and something is going to change. As something changed them, something could change them again. So tough with the statements, open as to the people and the persons and the hearts. Allahu Thank you very much, Prof. Ramadan. Can we have the second round? Uh, thank you very much, but... Uh, Doctor, I have read your latest book called Islam and the Arab Awakening. I go to your page 150 because you talk about the current contemporary uh, hegemony of the world that the Muslim world faces. Both in the sectors you talk about knowledge, you talk about uh, humanism, you talk about economics, culture and technology. Yesterday when we were going through the uh, the Davos uh, meeting, the foreign minister of Germany repeated that we are in a stage of global, new global contact where there is no order. On the three things they have given all of us is basically the progress, the concept of progress. That means there is always a perpetual state of to be rather than being. Secondly, the market, which is the neoliberal capitalism. And of course, the last, the nation state. Because in your proposal, that democracy is to be as a given. And we know where democracy came from, the Greeks. And of course, we know its own understanding that 
whether the place of the mere of the creator and the philosophy which Al Ghazali talks about and becomes the crisis for the Muslims today whether they go to Sharia has a legalism has a legal uh, component per se or we have corrupted Sharia for humanity my point to you sir is that the contemporary crisis of the Muslims is also historical now the question would be that the engagement of civilizational renewal from the 500 years or 300 years of Western hegemony requires a total revamp of what we talk about civilization. Why I say that? Because today when I heard the word competition, we know that under the common understanding we compete to dominate and control. Whereas Islam does not go for domination and control of the environment. We are in engaging our role as the custodian of the environment. And that, I think, a radical shift in the narrative of what Islam stands for mankind has a message from Adam until the day of judgment must be revisited. Because that engagement of why Islam is accepted by those who are of other faiths and those who couldn't understand reject it in their own understanding of the freedom to think. But I put to you, sir, that what we lack today is the wisdom of all the purpose of life. We talk about freedom, but we do not have the wisdom. And that, lost the adab, leads to the current social tradition and what you see in Charles Heb uh, Charlie Hebo is a social tradition of akhlaq of any decent man. Therefore, if society or nations want to conduct themselves in their own perspective worldview, there are certain fundamentals. One is the 3G, place of the creator. Second, create the goodness. And third, all the needs of human life has to be understood in this totality. Not a question of today, have you seen it? You may have read today, uh, uh, technology has an able of life. Today has become what I think, what they say today, the dark, uh, the dark internet. Because there is desire to control information, a desire to control sources of, uh, of, of power through a new face. And that is very worrisome. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Gary Dark and I'm a student at the Institute for Islamic Thought and Civilization. Um, my question is about the relationship actually between Islam and science, and specifically about biology. Uh, biotechnology is probably the fastest growing field in science at the moment, and it has enormous ethical implications for what can be spun off from it. But one of the great unifying ideas in biology is evolution and Muslims tend to comprehensively reject evolution as wrong. Now, I have a background in evolutionary biology and personally I can see a way through to reconcile this apparent conflict. Now, do I have a responsibility to do that and to push that message or should I just sit back and let the status quo be maintained? Uh, In-depth critique on that dogmatic mind, even Actually, I was, I was uh, inspired by you, Prof, uh, to study dogmatic mind. And uh, when I went and studied dogmatic mind from a psychological perspective, uh, it says uh, when a person is self-confident, uh, he believes whatever he understands, uh, he can be considered as a dogmatic mind. So, do, and in in the field of revivalism, uh, we feel this uh, very much in every way. Whenever we say something to someone and we want to change it or we want to critique it, this dogmatic mind comes into play and everybody uh, holds that position that, no, I am right, you are wrong. And so, so I, I really want to take this opportunity to learn and be explained what do you really understand or to tell us what is the dogmatic mind is. Thank you. Yes, for, uh, as to for your, your question on, on what, your, what was said in Davos and, and uh, uh, this relationship between uh, progress market and nation state. Um, in, in my book, the, the, the book that you are referring to, 
uh, and books before. It's not exactly what I'm saying about democracy and, and uh, uh, saying that, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, in agreement with Islam and that we take it for granted that Islam by definition is promoting democracy. <clears throat> it's a bit deeper than that what I'm trying to do. You say, I don't care about the words and the concepts. I, wor I, I care about the, the substance of the discussion. And what I tried to do, this was in the, the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, I, I, I tried to wrote about the principles that we find in the Islamic tradition when it comes to the rule of law, the equal citizenship, and all based on the Islamic tradition. Say, we have a set of principles. If you look at the democratic models, and by the way, there are common principles and different models. Even if you travel around Europe or, or, or wherever, you can see different models of democracy. And models are historical. Principles could be universal and transhistorical. So I'm saying that we don't have a problem with the principles. Now, the principles are to be thought in the light of the objectives that we want which has to do with social justice, was even the environment. You know, al-'urf is not only the interpersonal relationship and known, al-ma'ruf known as being good by the people, means also the way that we are treating, you know, the environment. That's, that's a very essential thing. Don't reduce, you know, environment to people. And don't reduce culture to the human expression. It's culture, it's also the environmental expression of, of how do you think. How do you deal with things? That's, that's very complex. It's not, you know, the way we are reducing that. And this is where, based on this, what I'm doing, it's a double critique. In the name of the principles and the goals, I'm quite critical about the, the Western democracies by saying, yes, there are very nice principles. Look, uh, let us study what is happening on the ground. How, you know, the dynamics are working. Who is deciding? How, for example, the political power is undermined by the economic powers. When Bill Clinton in the United States of America understood as the biggest uh, democracy in the world is saying only 1% of the people in this country and running the country, it means the people who have money. We talk about equal citizenship, but when you are a black man and, and you are dealing with this beyond the first African American being uh, elected, what we have on the ground is the black citizens, the African-American citizens have less rights because they have less money. And the socioeconomic structures or the class uh, realities are here. Racism is part of it, so we have to deal with this. So economy, uh, culture, equality, the nation state itself. And look, for example, about the media. You can change public opinion if you just deal with the media in many countries. And this is where the people were saying, look at what happened in less than four days. The election in Spain were changed in 2004 just after the terrorist attacks because of the emotional reaction of the people, which is something that was studied by Naomi Klein. And I, I, once again, this is a book that you have to read. No one should prevent you from reading that book, which is The Shock Doctrine. Very interesting book on the fact the way they are using sharks just to change and, and, and this is on political, the political side, but I would say that in the media is the same. So having said this, I think that you are right and you know, all what I have been doing now is to reconcile the sources, the means and the goals. And what you are referring to, the ethical side of the equation, it's important. You can't have a clear understanding of the goals if you don't bring into the discussion in legal matters, in political matters, in scientific matters, in all matters, the ethical side of it. We don't want science to progress, but we want progress to serve ethical goals. So it's all ethically oriented in Islam. Everything, so challenge sciences with ethics. Challenge philosophy with ethics, society with ethics. Why? Because ethics is where reconciliation happens between the sources that you have, the means that you are using, and the goals that you want to achieve. 
and you call it wisdom and this is where the fuqaha when it says uh, uh, was understood by some scholars as the sunnah as the legal no hikma it's also wisdom we have to take it al-hikmah. So the one who get hikmah, wisdom, is having something which is the greatest, uh, a great uh, uh, gift that is coming from God. So al-hikmah is something that is part of all our discussion about the ethical side of it. And I would say that uh, all I have been doing now with the center, we invited once uh, uh, Dr. Kamali to come. We are working on 11 fields. It's all about the ethical side, reconciling, uh, it's the, the center is about tashri'a, islami wa akhlaq, is ethics and the legal issues to come to something which is challenging the sources, challenging also the way we deal with sciences. That's, that's the whole philosophy that we are dealing with, because this is the point. And uh, you can see that everything that I'm writing, if you go on the, the website of the center of my, on Facebook, on my own website, you can see that everything is directed to this reconciliation, add wisdom and add ethics to all the means that we have. And even in, in, in all the structure that are now challenged, the nation state today is challenged, uh, the market. And it's not, it's not a question of structure, it's a question of... Uh, uh, goals of the very essence of it the same in the way we are dealing with our teaching it's not a question of structure it's the, na the, the, the uh, meaning uh, it's a question of substance that that's very essential in the way we are and very often our understanding of reform is a structural reform and we need a substantial reform the 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 the, the, the deep understanding of it uh, about your question on, uh, are you here, about evolution? I'm quite happy that you are raising this question because, you know, as much as I was, was responding to the brother that we need knowledge, uh, when it comes, you know, when we deal with liberals, we need knowledge. Some of our brothers and sisters, when they deal with scientists, they just come with some principles and they don't know what they are talking about. They don't know about the latest even hypothesis, scientific hypothesis that we have in biology about evolution. And this is where I think that you have to speak and to be able to say, look, for example, I was criticized by so many Muslims by saying I don't have a problem with evolution. I don't. I say, what? No, there is a difference between acknowledging that there is something, ev the evolution, and the type of scientific hypothesis explaining what happened. So you have scientific hypothesis that you can challenge. But the fact is that even in the Quran, خَلَقَكُمْ وَصَوَّرَكُمْ Sawarakum is also the understanding that he gave you a shape and this could be through history. So there is no contradiction in the fact that we can consider scientif scientifically evolution and the creation, uh, the way we deal ourselves with creation. And if you can bring something in this discussion, do it. Do it by explaining that you are not against the scriptural sources, but you are against superficial understanding. And some are, uh, they, you, you talk with them, say, how come, you know, and they come with reducing evolution to the Darwinist theories, I said, look, even dia some contemporary biologists are challenging this and discussing. Some are hypotheses that you have to deal with. So don't reduce everything. Science is not to reduce to the scientific hypothesis of some. Uh, uh, and this is where, for example, you know we have our uh, annual conference in Brussels. It's one of the topics. We are bringing it as it is, evolution in science. And we are bringing this discussion. Because we are, I myself, I'm fed up with people, they can't, you know, you have, I don't know how some people are putting you inside and outside Islam. You, you wrote, I don't know, 35 books. And somebody came to come to you and say, I listened to you on YouTube, two minutes. What you are saying is kuf. So what's that? Who are you? Who are you to come after two minutes? So my point is, get knowledge. Try to understand what is happening. How could you come to your brothers and say this? And say, 
are you the supreme judge in two minutes about all what we are trying to do in just be humble even after two minutes and especially after two minutes so I would say that but you know it's an example but some of us we are like this we are trained in some you know we have some uh, opinions we heard oh no evolution is kuf, say and we have creationists that are taking from the Christian uh, uh, evangelist tradition and they are repeating this I was sitting with some of the people who are uh, dealing with Harun Yahya I was sitting and say I'm sorry I'm sorry that this is scientifically wrong and your Islamic reference are disputable this is pure creationist this is taken taken from not from our tradition we are much more serious and demanding when science, when it comes to Islam. Don't, don't come with a superficial understanding of Islam and a superficial understanding of science. So if you are involved in this, and you have, at least if you are not sure that the people are listening to your answers, put the right questions. Put the right questions. So, uh, what about this? What do we have now? and help the people to get more knowledge. Muslims should stop protecting themselves with ignorance of science, thinking that they are knowledgeable about religion. Ignorance of science is not, it's not the right equation to think that you are knowledgeable about uh, religion. So it's both. And I would say that on that field, on many others, by the way, if you listen to what the Muslims are saying about psychology, even, even you know, I'm quite critical of Freud. But listen to some Muslims what they know about Sigmund Freud, about psychoanalysis. I say, what, what, what is this? If you were in first year of university, you would fail by saying what you are saying. So you want to challenge psychoanalysis? You want to challenge psychology? Know about what they are saying. Read what they are saying. And come with the right Islamic answer to this but these very superficial things that we have. And by the way, some of our scholars are keeping on repeating things that are completely wrong in, in many fields. So I would say that you have to do it. So this is the point. And, and, and this is what we are trying to do. It, we want to push our brothers and sisters and students and scholars and the ordinary Muslims to get more knowledge. And, 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 and this is why we are taking this uh, uh, in March. You, you, will, you will be able to have it, right? And this is good that if you can put our input in this, it will be uh, live stream from Brussels mid-March and one of the session is about evolution and by the way inshallah the next annual conference will be here in uh, Kuala Lumpur now think about the dogmatic mind uh, no it's not exactly you have to be very where are you you are here yes I, 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 there, I allocated one chapter in one book that is not very much read by Muslims it's quite interesting. I wrote a book called The Quest for Meaning, Developing a Philosophy of Pluralism. For the Muslims, it's not Islamic enough. And for non-Muslims, it's not Islamic enough. So I'm in between. And in fact, I was challenging by saying, I, I was talking about this uh, quest for meaning and, and from a pluralistic viewpoint. From an Islamic viewpoint as well as from a philosophical viewpoint, what is a dogmatic mind? A dogmatic mind is not a confident mind only. In fact, a dogmatic mind is getting his or her confidence out of arrogance and rejecting the others. It's not I'm confident in what I think. I'm so scared of what you think that I look at things only through a binary vision. And it's very simple. I'm right, so you are wrong. This is the dogmatic mind. In fact, from our understanding, what is a confident mind should be a mind and a heart that is ready to listen to others and try to find his or her answer with confidence, but ready to listen, ready to confront. And this is the opposite of the dogmatic mind. We should never be arrogant in Islam. Arrogance is the first sin. Ana khayrun minhu, said the shaitan. I am better than you. Without even li So you know this stance that I'm better, by definition I am better than you. I have the truth, so you are wrong. And not being in this understanding that uh, you look at things from different viewpoints. 
That's, that's Islam. And where does it come from in Islam? That Islam is telling us that we are the last message and our message is truth, isn't it? And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said something which is very important. What I quoted, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَعَلَكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا If Allah had with, He would have made you one community. لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ فِي مَا أَتَاكُمْ He's challenging you, He's testing you in what He gave you. فَاسْتَبَقُوا So you are in the competition of good. The second thing is, look at this. وَلَوْ لَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لَفَسَدَةِ الْأَرْضِ If Allah had not put a set of people against others, the world would have been corrupt. In fact, this diversity is helping you to be humble as to your truth and committed as to your knowledge. I need the non-Muslim to be challenged as to my Islamic principles and to be a better Muslim. It's not out of arrogance, but how do I need him or her? By listening, by challenging, by being challenged. Many non-Muslims help me to be a better Muslim, as I said. So arrogance is to come and to impose. Arrogance is not to listen. An arrogant mind, is dogmatic mind, is not listening, is asserting. Some of our brothers and sisters, they think about interface dialogue only as da'wah. So you come with a non-Muslim, people of other faiths, Christians, Jews, and you come and you listen to them, and the only thing that you have in mind is, I'm going to help you to be a good Muslim. Even with some of the people who are critical of, you know, the West, and even some people in, with Charlie Hebdo, for example, in France or in the States, are very, you know, objective in the way they deal with knowledge. The first question that we ask is, is he a Muslim? But that's not the point. The relationship between him and her and Allah, it's not of your business. It's not you. What you have to take from people is their seriousness, the commitment, the objectivity. This is what you are expecting. And some are helping you to be better. So this is the opposite of uh, uh, the dogmatic mind. To summarize, learn always to see the bad among your fellow brothers and sisters. And never forget to see the good in the people of other faiths. That's the point. And this is why you have to help your brothers and sisters when they are right and wrong. And one of the companions asks, how I can help my brother when he's wrong? Prevent him from doing bad. Meaning, you have to be self-critical with your own people. But you also have to acknowledge that some are bringing to the world so good things and they are not Muslims. They are not Muslims. They are people of other faiths that are bringing something. Once, and I will summarize and end with this, I was in a trial and now I was uh, uh, suing a, a, a newspaper because they were saying that I was nurturing terrorism in France, which you know is true. You have to cut that. I'm, I'm supporting terrorism, and, and, and then I, I, I sued the, 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 the magazine, and, and uh, of course, that was, you know, uh, rubbish and, and, and wrong. You know who was against me? A so-called mufti in France, who came against me saying, yes, of course, I know people who were influenced by him and went to jihad. This was 15 years ago. You know who came for me? Atheist, with a Jewish background, but clear on the principles, and he was facing the court and say, this never happened. So you have to be very careful. A dogmatic mind would say, all the Muslims are good. A serious mind would say, the good could be with us, and the good could be with others. Wallahu a'lam wa a'lam. Thank you very much, Prof. Ramadan. I'm afraid that I can't offer you any more for questions and answers. We are extended our time, given already. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. I, I saw many hands raised just now, but perhaps you can ask your questions in the next series of lectures within a couple of days of Prof. Ramadan's visit in KL. Totally, absolutely sorry. Um,
Before we end the session, I would like to call upon Prof. Hashim Kamali uh, to give away a token of appreciation to Prof. Tariq Ramadan. <laughs>